Now, without further ado, our first presenter will be Uk Panudanj from Google, and he's going to talk about drip reinforcement learning. back and see some familiar faces in the audience. And today I want to talk, you, to talk to you about some of what I consider the most exciting field of artificial intelligence research these days. So I'll do this by giving you first some context because I'm not, I'm not assuming that you have background uh, in this domain. And then I will try to explain you the fundamental concepts be, uh, behind deep reinforcement learning in a way that should be accessible for all. I mean, if you see some formulas on the slides, don't worry, I will explain everything with words and, and you should be able to follow up. And then I will conclude telling you what are some of the open problems and future, future challenges. So if I'm talking about AI, it's maybe good to start uh, to explain what I mean by intelligence. So the definition I like is the ability to learn to perform well in a wide range of environments. And artificial intelligence is just this property demonstrated by machines rather than humans or other animals that are also very intelligent. And why am I talking about uh, deep reinforcement learning? There are many other fields of research in, in AI. Um, so they, are, they are listed here. They can basically be split into two main fields, the more symbolic or traditional classic AI with things around um, logic, rule-based things, planning, and so on. And then there's what is now more mainstream, which is machine learning. So it's dealing more with the problems of perception and learning things from, from data. And uh, in the group at Google that I work on, it's called DeepMind, uh, we focus a lot in this field of deep reinforcement learning. So that's why I'll, I'll talk about it. Here I also put a timeline uh, of AI research. You don't need to see all the details, but I just want to highlight two points. The formal study of AI started around the 1950s with uh, people like uh, Alan Turing, Minsky, McCarthy, and so on. And it has gone, th gone through different waves of um, enthusiasm and, uh, and uh, disappointment. So in the 60s, people were already saying that like, in 20 years from then, everything would be solved and you'd have intelligent machines. Obviously, it turned out to be much harder, and there were these phases that people called AI winters, in which uh, research really hit some roadblocks. And on the bottom part, I'm just putting some uh, landmark events that are uh, somehow related to deep reinforcement learning, and I will explain some of these concepts later, and I will show the timeline again for you. Okay, so you might have heard of uh, the recent successes of uh, DeepRL, and the ones I'm listing here are, com are coming from Google DeepMind. So around 2014 or something like that, there was this uh, nature paper uh, showing uh, uh, a system that was able to play a, a great variety of co uh, video games in this at Atari console uh, that just learned to, uh, to do this by, by self-play and controlling the agent directly by just looking at the image and deciding what to do without any human uh, supervision on this. You probably also heard about the game of Goat. So this is a very complex uh, board game. It's very famous in, in Asia, and there are really professionals that play this super strongly. And just one or two years ago, uh, we had a system called AlphaGo that was able to beat the best players in the world in this. So this generated a lot of excitement. There's actually now a a documentary, you can check it out, about uh, uh, half ago, and like, you can see some of my colleagues there. It's actually really, really funny for me, because if I go to IMDb, I can see the names of my colleagues listed as actors playing themselves in this movie. Um, and also successes in like, tasks like 3D navigation and so on. So what I want to uh, try is to explain some of the fundamental concepts behind these achievements. And I will do so by following this strategy. Deep reinforcement learning is at the intersection of two fields, deep learning and reinforcement learning. So I'll go first explain deep learning, well, some, a little bit of it, uh, and then reinforcement learning. So the first thing to notice is that deep learning is actually just a rebranding of the field of uh, neural networks 
And the name Deep just came from the fact that at some point people were able to train uh, neural networks with many more layers, so deep models rather than shallow. And uh, this, was, uh, this field is somehow inspired by what happens in the brain and the connections between neurons and so on. But neural networks are really better understood as the like, concrete mathematical objects that they are. And what they are is just functions that take a set of, like a vector of numbers as inputs and output one or, or more numbers. And uh, typically the operations that each layer performs are very, are, perform are very simple. It's just some linear algebra operations such as a matrix vector multiplication added with some bias vector and then typically element-wise you apply some non-linearity. So what this means, you don't have to understand all the, these details, is that these are generic function approximators. So the same neural network with the same number of neurons and so on, depending on the choices of numbers you put in this matrix, so these, they represent this uh, weight of these connections, this same neural network can represent very different functions. And so here on the right I plot uh, what would be like the output of uh, the same neural network but just with uh, different weights. So, okay, so these are just generic uh, function approximators. What can you do with them, right? So, for example, imagine that you, you wanted to uh, solve the problem of distinguish, distinguishing images of uh, cats from images of dogs. So, in fact, what you are saying is that you would wish to have a function such that when you pass as an input, uh, like the raw pixel values, so this is like a vector of numbers, to your neural network, you would wish that it would output something like, say, minus one if it's a cat, and plus one if it's a dog. So you're saying that this is the function you'd wish to have. Now, how do you go about finding the weights of the neural network that represent such a function? Well, what you do is actually reduce the learning problem, which is this problem of finding the right weights, to an optimization problem. And you would do so by first collecting a data set of images that are annotated, so you have like images of cats with label minus one, images of dogs with plus one, and then you define what we call a loss function, which is basically just some smooth differentiable function that will tell you how close you are to getting to these answers you expect, right? So if you are outputting uh, let's say plus three for an image of a cat that should be minus one, this you will incur a loss, a penalty. And the closer you get, the closer your network is outputting the thing you expect, the lower this function it is. So if you construct such a function, then really learning is just minimizing a function. And here you can really reuse a lot of uh, knowledge from other fields like numerical optimization and very simple algorithms that you probably learn like in the first year of, of university here. So the, the simplest one, and uh, it's commonly used, is just gradient descent. So this means that if you're trying to find the minimum of this function, what you'll try to do is take small steps in the direction in which you minimize this function a little bit. So this is what the gradient means. is like the direction in which you will adjust each of the weights just a little bit to decrease the value of your loss function. So now you are doing a little bit better. And uh, so you need a way to, comp to compute this, uh, this gradient. And this, already in the 80s, there was a, uh, an algorithm known as backpropagation that just does, does that and does it efficiently, for, even for networks with many layers. So, so why, why did deep learning uh, became so successful only recently, right? So what, what happened is that with the following this recipe, right? So if you have a lot of data, which you, we do have now, if you have lots of compute, uh, particularly with the emergence of uh, graphical cards and GPUs that are very useful for these uh, matrix and vector operations, and by the fact that we are now able to train uh, neural networks with many layers that can be more expressive, we can... Uh, uh, get really things that are really uh, competitive in, in speech and vision tasks. And I just put there some technical magic tricks that are basically there to justify our salaries, obviously. Um, okay, so if you are 
uh, for those of you that are uh, students or, for, or in general, if you want to learn more about neural networks, these are the fields of mathematics that you should pay attention to, like statistics, linear algebra, differential calculus, numerical optimization. So if you are interested. So up to now, I covered more or less uh, these things, like this perceptron was like the first single neural network that was described in the research literature. Then in the 80s, there was this back propagation. And now I mentioned that more recently, there has been these breakthroughs because of this much more computational power being available and much bigger data sets. So we are now ready to talk about the other component, which is reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is, uh, deals with the setup in which an agent is interacting with an environment. So the agent sees some observation. Uh, it can then decide to take some action which will influence, influence the state of, of the world, and then you get new observations and some rewards. So the reward can be you know, either negative, positive, or, or zero. It tells you basically how well you are doing at the task that you, you are trying to solve. And uh, basically the goal of the agent is to find a good behavior policy, which is just a function that given a, a state or observation decides which action to take, such that it maximizes the sum of rewards it will get into the future. And possibly this, with a discount factor to give more importance to immediate rewards than rewards too much into the future. Okay, so in fact, again, already in the late 80s, there were algorithms that were solving this problem. So if you have these very simple like grid world environments, like uh, not many states, and you had uh, like discrete states and not, not many of those, there was this algorithm called Q-learning, um, which basically tells you, if you are able to estimate this function, this Q function, which is basically tells you, if I'm in this state, S, and now take this action, A, and from then onwards I behave uh, according to my policy, what is the expected sum of rewards I will get into the future? So if you know this, you can then start in acting according to it, right? Like, you will just choose the action that will maximize uh, this expected reward. And there is a very simple iterative algorithm. You can even see this one line uh, rule applied there that I copy paste from Wikipedia, which basically, if you apply this, you'll progressively estimate this quantity and also get, get better and better policies. It's even proven for these simple grid world cases that this will converge to the optimal policy. So that's all great. Um, However, the only really uh, successful result in merging these two fields, like neural networks and uh, reinforcement learning that happened in that time was around 92, in which there was this system, you probably uh, heard about it in the classroom, about TD Gammon, which played the game of, of backgammon. So this was exciting, but then for a long time, nothing really happened in this field. No, no more uh, complex problems were solved by merging reinforcement learning and neural networks, which was a bit disappointing. In particular, in 97, when Kasparov was beaten by uh, Deep Blue, no such ideas were used. Basically, it was human heuristics with brute force search. So it was really not a learning system. It was not a system that learned by playing. Um, well, so I will tell you why now DeepRL emerged again uh, only recently. So, like I mentioned before, so some of my colleagues, uh, what they did, if, uh, so DeepMind uh, was an AI uh, research company in, in London that got acquired by Google in 2014. And one of the reasons they got acquired was actually because they showed impressive results in this. So this is like a, a, an environment in which you have all of these games from the Atari console, r roughly 50 games. And the challenge is, can you train, can you uh, come up with a system that is able to play all of them just by looking at the images like a, a human would do and by having access to the score so you know how, how, well, how, how many points you are, you are getting, but you get no further instructions on, uh, on what to be behave well. So the solution was really, uh, just taking one neural network, it has a, a different architecture to what I showed before. It's more adequate for vision. It's called a convolutional uh, neural network. 
But basically, it takes the observations from the raw pixels, and it directly outputs these estimates for this Q function I told you about. So for each action of the joystick, you see there the app arrows and whether you are pressing a key or not. This network was estimating how much future reward it would get by playing that action at that point in time. And this was trained basically using the same uh, algorithm from uh, the 80s, Q-learning, with a few added tricks to make it stable, because in the case of using neural networks, there are no longer guarantees of convergence and stability compared to those small grid worlds. So that was the, the innovation there, was really to make this uh, training process stable and be able to scale it to much more complex environments. And so on the right, you see that uh, there's, for all of these games, you see the horizontal um, line there is the, um, the human level uh, uh, performance. So at DeepMind, there is like a professional gamer that is like throughout the days playing these games and creating benchmarks so that we know what <laughs> the human level is. And then you can compare with the algorithms. And as you see, for a great majority of these games, the, the computer was playing better than the human, with the exceptions of the one at the bottom. And, you know, similar ideas were used for, for AlphaGo. AlphaGo is a little bit more complex because it also involves, it's a two-player game, and it also involves doing a search. So you have to plan ahead and so on. But it also has these components of having a deep neural network. It has the reinforcement learning ideas there. And it achieved uh, superhuman results. Since then, my colleagues also extended this to other games, so they made the system even more, more generic. So rather than just using the same system to play Go, they were able to use pretty much the same algorithms to also master the game of chess, this time by learning, unlike the, uh, Deep Blue in the, in the late 90s, and a game called Shoggy. There is also results on poker using variations of these systems. Um, so it's, it's really impressive and it's getting more and more generic. If you recall what I said in the beginning as intelligence being the ability to learn to perform well in different environments, you see how these uh, game setups and so on are a good test bed for this, uh, for this because you can test in different games uh, with different properties how well your algorithms without, many, with, without major modifications they will do well in all of these environments. So, so actually by now you could start, uh, uh, well actually let me just uh, co conclude with this slide. Uh, what I just mentioned highlights the latest results here on the right, right? So these are the, the most recent um, successes. So you might be wondering, is artificial intelligence solved already? It looks like we are even using old algorithm and just by scaling things, everything seems to be working well for different problems. Well. I want to say that, I want to argue that this is not really the case, and I will explain you this using the framework of reinforcement learning and highlighting why some challenges are still open. So, in RL, I said we are interacting with an environment. So, the formal way to describe an environment is basically made up of four things the action space that is available for the agent, so which actions you can take, and so on, how many. Uh, the state space, which describes what's going on in the world, and the environment dynamics, which means if you are in a given state and you take an action, what is the effect in the world? For example, if, uh, if I kick a ball, there will be some effect, right? The ball will end up somewhere and it will change the, the world. And what is the reward function? So uh, depending on what you do, what are the rewards that you get? Okay, so let's start with... Um, with the action space. It can either be a, a, a small action space, for example, in Atari, you only have up to 18, in this like uh, uh, video games, you only have up to 18 actions to take. So like, these are different combinations of the things you press in the joystick. In Go, you have up to 361 positions in the beginning that you can place your stone. However, if you think of, uh, let's say, games like StarCraft, or real-world systems like uh, recommender systems, suppose you are suggesting the next video to watch in YouTube, this can easily be millions or billions of actions. 
So naturally, this will be a much harder environment to learn on. You have to test many things to start understanding how things work, right? The other difficulty is that uh, some uh, action spaces are discrete, so there's only one over n actions that you can take, right? However, other ones are continuous, so if you think of robotics or these locomotion tasks, uh, the actions you need to take is like uh, the angles in the joints, and these are real valued uh, continuous variables, right? So this also makes learning harder. In the state space, it's, you have this, the similar situation, so it can either be a, a, a small state space or very large, but even he, here, even in Atari and Go, these are already very large state space. So for example, in Go, people computed that there are more uh, combination, different combinations of board situations than atoms in the universe. So you, here you can already argue that we are operating with large state space. There's also, again, the problem of whether it's discrete or continuous. And there is one further very important complexity, which is whether the world is observable, like in fully observable. For example, in Go, you look at the board and the configuration of, configurations of the stones tell you everything you need to know about what's going on, or whether it's partially observable. So in, if you are in a 3D navigation environment, I'm only looking in one direction, so I only know what is going on here, not there. So in here, your agent would need to keep some sort of memory, some sort of internal representation of the global state of the world, and would have to construct this by aggregating evidence at each time step. So this is also much harder. This is also is, is a research problem. Uh, when I mentioned the environment and dynamics, so in some uh, environments, like Atari, uh, the effect of an action in a given state is deterministic. So if you do that again, it will lead to the same outcome. However, in other domains, they are stochastic, so there is some random component to it. Um, like I was saying before, if you kick a ball and the, the wind blows, it will not end up in the same location as if you do it again later, right? So obviously this is also harder because you now need to create a, an understanding of how the world behaves and it's not fully predictable. And the last one that I want to highlight is the reward function. So here, we also have the problem of deterministic versus stochastic. So if you do something and you get always the same reward, okay, you are able to evaluate how good this action is. However, if this is also random, you will have to try it many times, right? Until you figure out if you did something good or wrong, because maybe you get a good reward, but it was just by luck. And in fact, all the other times you'll do it in the future, you'll get low reward. And then there is another difficulty, which is super crucial, and this is really a, an active research field, which is whether your uh, reward is dense or sparse. So what do I mean by this? In some games, like in this uh, Atari breakout, um, pretty much everything you do, you will get some immediate rewards. You don't have to wait much time. However, in some environments, like this game, like this Montezuma Revenge, you almost never see a reward. So you have to go down a staircase, go up another one, pick a key, go to another room, open a door, blah, blah, until you even see the first reward. So this is very hard for learning because what these systems do is like they try things out in the beginning. They try randomly actions to see if something is working. And if by following this like random exploration in the beginning, you never actually see a reward, you don't have opportunity even to start learning. It's just like everything seems indifferent. So this is a very open and challenging problem for researchers, and you can even see that in this plot I showed earlier, the games in which this current system is doing poorly are these ones that have very sparse rewards and you have to solve the exploration problem. So this is like really central in reinforcement learning. Okay, and I just want to conclude by mentioning that in addition to these challenges that exist already in simulated domains and games, if you want to bring uh, RL or AI in general to the real world, things get even harder, right? Because you just don't have a simulator. Uh, and if you have to interact and learn by interacting with the real world, you need to respect safety constraints. You need to respect the user experience in cases like some website or so, and you don't want to degrade their experience. And also, these algorithms, they typically take a long time to learn. So in this Atari domain, is typically like 
tens or hundreds of millions of iterations. So it's, it's a long uh, learning process. And obviously, you cannot do this in real systems. It's just too slow. So we would need to be much more sample efficient. So I hope you, I convince you that this, this is an exciting field of research. There's a lot of cool things that can come out of it, both in terms of our understanding of the brain, understanding of intelligence, and in terms of applications. So now, if you have some questions, I'll be helpful to answer them, and I'll also be around during the day so you can chat to me if you, if you have more, more to discuss. So, as I said before, we have a system, which is me, to know if anyone has any kind of questions. So tell me, for, do you have any questions? Or do you already feel comfortable with artificial intelligence and you want to know nothing <laughs> about it? Hi. Thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, one question, and you, you might have answered it in your uh, presentation, but I was just wondering. So when we're playing video games, like more complex, like uh, first-person shooters, there's a big difference normally between the difficulty when you're like in something like where you're like Metal Gear Solid, where there's like a set place where you go and visit, and uh, there's a bunch of guards, and they might be harder or easier to, to shoot. But then if you're playing some open game, the bots are typically much worse. Is that because of the constraints in the environment, or is it just because they want them to be weak? Sorry, can you repeat why they are missing? Uh, why, why is there such a difference in difficulty sometimes between like bots that you find in open, open world games against bots uh, or non-PCs non that you find in the closer environment games? If it's because of the, the way they're built, just to be easier, or is it actually harder for them to be more effective? So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to answer exactly your question, but uh, my understanding is that like in these games, the bots that are pre-coded in the games, they fall into two categories. It's normally the non-cheating ones, so the ones that have access to the same information that the, the player would have, so you have just partial observability. And uh, already doing this is hard, because if you have to write by hand explicit rules on how to play under these constraints, they're not going to be very strong. And then there are some bots that will be super strong, because they are cheating in the sense that they have access to the, to the, the state of the whole world, whereas you, as a gamer, don't. And this can typically be much stronger, right? So the challenge for AI research would be to see if, uh, using these learning algorithms, you can get to the level, you know, well, first of this kind of uh, simpler bots, and then to the level of the ones that are cheating, but without cheating. <laughs> OK. Anyone else? Over here. The system is working. This is reinforcement. I'm learning and uh, trying yeah. to see if criteria works. <laughs> um, so. You mentioned there are several uh, games in which the AI performs better than the uh, control human. For um, Does it perform better because it's simply more efficient at doing the same things a human does? Or does it have a completely different way of playing and develops different strategies altogether? OK, thank you for the question. Um, it really depends, right? So. So in some games like this uh, StarCraft or so, first you want to impose some constraints such that the AI system doesn't have an advantage of just because it's faster and can click more and so on. So you want to make it a, a play level field. Um, and then it, it's comparable, right? But still, I mean, for example, in AlphaGo, even though the, the neural networks that AlphaGo use, uses somehow do what our will, will humans do, like they have some intuition about what the good move is and they don't have to search everything. I mean, still AlphaGo would be able to search more board positions than uh, a human would do. However, AlphaGo searches much fewer board positions than, for example, Deep Blue did. So what it does is, uh, is use the neural network to have an estimate of whether uh, a certain move is promising or not, and uses this to prune the search. So in this, in this sense, 
is doing something very similar to humans, right? We don't go into detail until the end of the game imagining all the situations. You have an idea, okay, this is not very promising, let's try something else. So in this sense, it's, uh, machine learning is converging to do things more like humans do. Thank you. We have time for one more question over there. How do you model a system uh, like the one you showed for the Atari, the second game, the 2D game where the character jumps and so on? How do you model it with the deep reinforcement learning you showed with the Q algorithm and, uh, and the deep uh, neural network? Um, how do you mo because you have, you have the input, the, the joystick movement, and the action, you have the result of the um, of the character if it dies or if it stays alive. But then you have to take uh, into account the next actions and the, the result of the next actions, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you model this? Yeah, so the, the thing that you train is just really this neural network that takes the current frame, well, it's actually the current last four frames as input and predicts this, this value, right? Uh, and uh, I think I mentioned before, uh, it's not here. Uh, so the, the thing you try to predict is not just the immediate effect of what the reward you will get in the next time frame, it's really the, the sum of rewards you will get into the future. That's why you can rely, once you train this neural network, you can rely that it's, it's thinking long term, it's not just maximizing for short-sighted uh, returns. But you do this, but this uh, Q-learning algorithm provides you that, so basically by playing, uh, and, and seeing the effects of, in the long run of your actions, it will, you will be able to update this neural network to predict what is the long-term effect of this action, not just the immediate. Okay, so if you're calculating for each state of the game what is the best, uh, what is the best action to, fo uh, to, to follow next, what is the difference between what you implemented and the simple minimax algorithm? Right, so the question here is that in these uh, games, in which you have a very comp high dimensional ob observation space, like uh, all the images that you can observe in the game, you no longer uh, uh, use like a, a table to, re to, to record for this uh, state, uh, this action, and so on. Now you use the neural network to approximate this. So it's, um, it's, it's not as if you are b by heart memorizing for each state what, what is the correct action. You have to compact this into, the, into this neural network that is able even for unseen states. So the hope of machine learning is that you also generalize, right? So once you have trained it, you can even show things that you have never seen before and you still have an estimate of how to behave. Um, I don't know if that answers. Yes, yes, question. it does. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hugo. See you next time. Bye-bye.